What is going on, everybody? Bobby Fye here with the Saber Sim team. A couple of guys here. We've got uh, Jordan uh, and uh, Andrew. Uh, we also have Goldie and, and Eric from our side of it. We want to talk to you guys a little bit about sort of how to best, best utilize Saber Sim. And we did a video last year about this, but I think that we've got a lot more people now who are interested. How do you best utilize TrueDFS slash Saber Sim uh, for MLB specifically? And uh, you know, Jordan's going to be doing most of the driving on this video. We're going to be popping in with questions and thoughts and anything you guys have that come up from this, feel free to hit us up in our, in our, in our uh, discord and, and, you know, we'll get questions answered for you. Cause I know that some of you guys do scripting. I don't do as much of it. Sheets does some of it. Um, we're sort of all coming at it from different angles uh, between Sheets, Goldie and I, although Sheets and Goldie are more on the same, closer to the same page than I am. So um, we're going to, we're going to just, you know, walk through it and, and see how it goes, walk through a build. And uh, yeah, Jordan, I think we can take it away. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and dive in here. So I, I think the, the first thing that's important to, to grasp when you start using Saber Sim here, or maybe even just start using it for baseball, um, is that it's it's quite a bit different than a typical optimizer. Uh, what we're actually doing here behind the scenes is we're taking each baseball game on the slate here, and we're simulating that game out play by play thousands of times. Uh, so what, what literally happens on the back end here is top of the first inning, leadoff batter comes up to bat. Uh, we have a probability of all the different outcomes that can take place at that at bat, uh, strikeout, single guy walks, hits a home run, whatever happens based on the pitcher skill, uh, the batter skill, the weather, the park, all of that information there. Then after that play, the next batter comes up and we're actually taking these play by play, taking into account the context of the current game state uh, and simulating out these games. Uh, so when the you pull up Saberson for the first time, you see a lot of familiar data here, like you'd see on other tools, projection, ownership, and so on. Uh, that's really just a summary of what's going on behind the scenes here. Uh, I think one of the best ways to actually just kind of start to visualize this here is to click on a player name. You can see Aaron Judge tonight projected for 10.64 points. Uh, this is actually his true distribution of what is possible in this game. Uh, from the most common outcomes, which is zero. Uh, I think that that sometimes comes as a surprise to people unfamiliar with baseball distributions or used to the average projections. Uh, and then obviously the big ceiling outcomes here where he's, you know, maybe hitting a home run or two. And the correlations, right? Very important for baseball in particular here. Uh, not only do we know what Aaron Judge's true range of outcomes are here, we know how he is correlated to the other hitters in the order, right? As the guys are getting on base, uh, the opposing pitcher is failing to get outs creates more scoring opportunities for all the other batters in the order. So I think most people are familiar. Hey, baseball, I want to stack, right? Uh, one thing that, that Saberson really allows you to do here is precisely quantify these correlations between players uh, based on their overall skill, uh, their position in the batting order, and things like that. So uh, when we actually build lineups with Saberson, and we'll, we'll get to building lineups here in just a second, that data is actually being taken into account for each individual lineup. Uh, it's not just optimizing for the average projections. We're actually taking simulated outcomes for how these games could play out, combining it with the correlation we have from the game simulations, uh, and then building profitable lineups that, that represent what the actual winning lineup would be when those different game scripts take place here. So, uh, with all that said, I think the practical advice there, and I think what we'll kind of talk about here. Uh, is that typically we recommend a little bit of a less is more approach with SaberSim, especially if you're used to going into a traditional optimizer, setting, you know, 50 different rules of how you want to stack each team, uh, relaxing some of those constraints, uh, putting in just what is the most important to you, and then doing a lot of your work post-build. Uh, one of the things that is also very unique about SaberSim is we build more lineups than you're ever actually going to play to allow you to have a lot of control of which of those lineups you ultimately want to take with you into your contest. So uh, overall, just a, a better approach to, to building GPP lineups here. Um, I know you guys here uh, are, are pretty familiar with that uh, using Saberson for a long time, but any, any questions from, from you guys here or any, anything well, that you wanted to ask right off the bat before we kind of just start looking at a process here? Well, before, before I get into that, I, I would just kind of like to mention, I mean, I know these guys, guys for a while and I, and I use Saber Sim for, for all of the sports and I play all of the sports, mm -hmm. like everything that's legal in, in this, in this state I, I play. Um, and I, I've been, pr I've been pretty vocal about this next point Saber Sim is very good, and this type of approach is really good for for you know for all the sports. But the two sports that Saber Sim, at least for me, 
provides the most like excessive value over you know other types of optimizers is our our is this sport and hockey okay mm -hmm. baseball and hockey a and the reason for that in, in my opinion is because so much of baseball and hockey depend on correlation and depend on knowing how much to correlate and and, and this type of thing that I've it just in my experience, like the lineups that I build using SaberSim for both hockey and for baseball are, you know, are very not intuitive to me. I mean, they're sort of intuitive, but when I when I build like my basketball lineups with SaberSim, they mm -hmm. come up with stuff that I, you know, just kind of makes sense to me. That's kind of what I would probably do anyway, or but you know, with a little bit of upside. But when I put when I build these baseball and hockey lineups, they always look, wow, that's kind of interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that. But all I can say is that. Every single one of my big caches in both hockey and in baseball were lineups that I literally would never have come up with by hand. Okay. They would be, and even they wouldn't have been ones that I come up with just by, by going in and say, okay, I want five man, this four man, this max three, this max three, this putting in like 700 rules every single time in baseball that I myself have cast really huge. It's been I would do like a portfolio of 30 lineups and like the 26th lineup that, that cashes for like a hundred thousand. I'm like, this thing is the one that I'm competing <laughs> with. I, I can't even imagine. And and that's just, I don't know what, what, what goes on behind the scenes. And one thing that these guys mentioned, and I'm very vocal about this as well, with respect to less is more. Listen, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm, I read a hedge fund. I, I, I like analyzing. I'm doing whatever, but the less you mess with or F with or tweak the, the, the SaberSim algorithm and what it's trying to do for you, really the better off you are. I mean, once you start replacing your own opinions with too much of what SaberSim is going to try to let you try to make you do, um, you're really just costing yourself, especially in baseball. Now, I know it's going to seem for you guys, well, I want to put my own opinion. I don't want to just like put my projections in here and let them just build me lineups. I know that your ego doesn't want you to do that, okay? But you should start with with the with the presumption that their algorithm and their simulations and their lineup builders are smarter than you, and they put a lot of money and a lot of work and a lot of time in this. Not necessarily so that you don't have to to, to kind of like you know make it seem stupid, but but so that you don't have to. So I would start with the regular saber sim builds and the and the system before starting to tweak that much yeah agreed um and i think there are places in the process where you can add a little bit of that value in a more safe way i i, I typically recommend people that do have a stand they want to take uh end up doing that after the lineups have been built so you're not affecting the inputs as much uh changing what our models say but choosing lineups differently based on the, the stands that you want to take here so um Right off the bat on the home screen here, when we when we start building again, this is where I'd, I'd take a lighter touch, but a couple things that I think are useful. Uh, first, with the true DFS subscription here, uh, you get access to a couple different projection sets. You do get the Saberson projections, which are listed in the Saberson column, and by default, the my projection column, but also the true DFS projections and the Goldie projections here for ownership uh, and actual player projections. So uh, if you want to take kind of a wisdom of a crowd approach here, uh, we can average those out. Uh, mm -hmm. Use the average between those three different models for both uh, projections and ownership. Uh, in general, I, I kind of like to take that approach with a lot of sports I play. If you have these, these projections at your disposal here, uh, you just get to typically the effect of that is you bring in some of the outliers here a little bit. Uh, you do still get to take advantage of the Saber Sim simulations when you're doing that. I know that's a very common question from people. Uh, I, if I'm using a different projection set, changing projections at all or anything like that, uh, do I still get to use the Sims? The answer is yes. Uh, all that happens is we shift the sims slightly based on the difference between the original projection and then the new uh, change projection. So in this I, case, I, I, yeah, I would like to say before before we move on, this is I'm yeah. going to mention these guys offline, but I think it's important to talk about this. If you're going to use, you know, our our saber sim within true DFS, and and you select the average, I, I would be very careful about that because okay. be, be, no 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 because. Sometimes if you go, go through, sometimes for whatever reason, I'll project the guy at zero just for no, because I, I didn't put him in the player pool or I forgot or, or whatever it is. And, and Saberson will have him in. And, and what, what we'll do is we'll average those numbers. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. That's like probably the worst thing you could do. You know what I mean? Like if you guys have a 10 and I have like a zero, cause I just didn't put him in. 
I mean, it's going to show up as a five. Yeah. And that's really not good. Um, so just be careful when you're just straight up averaging that you're averaging, you know, like, like, like people with actual projections in them. Um, yeah. that, that's, that was to be my one caveat. And, and it's something maybe we can work on on the side. Like if it's like, let's just say Saber Sim is 20, Goldie is 20 and True DFS is zero to make it like 20, you know, as far as the average goes or something like that. But, yeah. but that's the one thing about the average that I would, um, that I would call, like, you see with that one down here, Tyler Wells, mm-hmm. like Tyler Wells, you see there, it's like a seven and then it's like a zero, you know, and, and to, to average all three of those at 6.84, it's not really fair to do that. Yeah, yeah. considering he pitched five innings last night, I actually think the zero is probably accurate. There um, you go. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not going to be throwing tonight. Yeah, um, but 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 that's the thing, and and and, and it, but it's an it's an important point, and then and that'll correct later in the day, of course. But just something that, that right. is worth noting. I also did want to add that, like, you'll have uh, my my four plays in here every day for baseball. Um, I usually do one uh, pay up and pay down at every position, um, and then I we also get Goldie's uh, Gold, Goldie's core plays as well. Um, and, uh, just wanted to add that we'll have that stuff added, you know, usually around, uh, two or three Eastern time or a few hours before the slate starts. So another thing that, you know, you get through with, uh, true DFS through Saber Sim. The other thing before he continues is, you know, when, when I, when I collect all my, you know, all, all the stuff from the industry or whatever, and then I, then I put my own tweaks in or whatever, you'll notice for those of you that play other sports, that the differences between projections in baseball is just is so is minute. Okay. It's very, very small. And um, I'm not saying they're not important or whatever it is, but but the point is is that don't get too hung up on, on if one person has 20, another has 19.98. The real key to 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 building baseball lines, especially with Saberson, is what's done in the line of build process, mm-hmm. you know. We're supposed to basketball. We're honestly like uh, probably like seventy percent of the skill is figuring out the projections and figuring out what what guys may, maybe you know what their medium range of outcomes is, and then obviously building for upside. But in baseball, there everybody's going to you know come up with very very similar projections. But the real key is going to be what goes on after. This. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I think we should get right into it here um, yeah. and and build some lineups. So uh, we'll get that started here. Most important thing is really just selecting what contest you're building for. Uh, this will change the sliders here a bit. Uh, correlation this year is cranked up pretty high. We've got this on 10. This was recently back tested here. Uh, correlations also improved behind the scenes since last baseball season. Uh, we changed this. So this is better taking into account the player upside. Uh, so when we're looking at how correlated Aaron judge is to the rest of the Yankees lineup, we're looking at how high that correlation is when Aaron judge is having a ceiling outcome, which is ultimately what's important for what we're trying to do in GPPs. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's improved. That is recently back tested. The sim diversity slider, big changes here too. Uh, this is just doing a better job now of actually bucketing and binning up those sims here uh, for more accurate game outcomes here for for the outcomes where we actually get those upside those gpp winning scores so now, uh, now, you, now you get to explain by the way for the seven hundred thirty seven thousandth time what sim diversity is yeah so i and i and i should do that here um so what it is is this is basically how many simulations are you looking at per lineup uh, in, a, in a nutshell. So at zero, this is looking at the average projection. It is every simulation we have for each game on the slate. Uh, at 10, it is a single game simulation per lineup. So each game will get a random sim out of thousands of sims. The projections that players scored in that outcome are ultimately what's used for that lineup. So uh, sim diversity is pretty high by default for baseball and especially for these larger field GPPs. I think that's a good thing. Uh, the practical advice I would give for these is, again, probably just leave these alone. Uh, Matt puts in an immense amount of work into backtesting these, uh, mm-hmm. both taking into account pure ROI, but also your risk, the, the downside you're taking on on playing certain lineup sets to kind of come up with this combined uh, set of, of sliders here that's that's optimized for really for profit realization is the way I would actually uh, describe it here. So uh, not the best place to start adding value. I would I would set the sl- the defaults at where they are for the contest you're building for uh, and go from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, one thing I was going to ask you, and this is a, a little bit not maybe yeah, it's a little off topic. How do you, how do you guys handle like the thing with the pitch clock and the fact that we're seeing stolen bases? What are they up almost three hundred percent so far this season? Um, yeah, how do you guys, how did you guys account for that, or how do you account for that going forward? 
Andrew, you've been pretty close to the model team here. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, of course. Uh, so we have been uh, tracking through spring training and looking at whatever data was available and using some uh, intuition along the way prior to the season starting, prior to opening day to make some initial adjustments there. And we've been taking it really like on like a day by day approach, uh, keeping close tabs on what these rates are, how they are changing, because it's it's a little different when a rule change is causing the rates to change as opposed to uh, looking at like decay rate optimization and like historical uh, stolen base percentages. So like it's like a direct uh, it's a direct. A result of these rule changes as opposed to a batter getting slower or faster or or things along those lines so we've been um pretty aggressive i would say with the way that we've been handling it uh users will uh ask about it a lot but um i would say for for like rookies and different players and getting to like a um a steady balance. I think, I think uh, M- NBA is a good approach. Like how often are rookies playing early in the season and then their minutes kind of level out uh, that takes time. But for something like this um, we're, we're handling it much more aggressively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My understanding there is that we did make a, a pretty big manual adjustment to increase stolen base attempts and success rates at the start of the year. And mm-hmm. from just the first, almost week of data we even undershot that a bit from what we're seeing so uh i think we could uh continue to to increase that a bit um as well there but Mm -hmm. yeah no i I, yeah i appreciate it as i was just curious that's a big thing that i've noticed and um as a guy who always tries to get off the board and usually do like uh, like a lot of four two two stacks four three ones that instead of the five the typical five three or five two one um i I, i've noticed that I'm, i'm much more leaning towards correlation um i think even in the amount of, what did i read the other day the, the double steals on there was like three or four double steals on opening day usually it, it's been like i don't know it was like a week and a half till last year till somebody double stole in the game i just think that it's an interesting thing that 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 i'm just interested how it how it affects correlation i still haven't yeah. been out entirely myself so i was curious at your guys take on it anyway we can move on to, to the next step i just wanted to ask about that yeah no i mean it's interesting i and i think offense just in general is up as well like even like yeah. uh just from a raw hitting perspective. I don't know if that's a, a pitch clock effect or, or what's going on there, but definitely something that the models team is keeping an eye on. Eric on our team uh, does a lot of work on just kind of keeping track of where projections are at and what some of these rates look like. And I know he's he's keeping a close eye on it to start the year. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a wild summer where you start seeing a lot of double-digit scoring and stuff just, mm-hmm. because, just because the nature of, of the way the game is being played with the pitch clock. And again, the stolen bases are going to be up and you're going to, I think, see a lot more offenses have like those monster days anyway. We can move on. Sorry, I just wanted to touch on those things. No, no worries. Yeah, so we've got the build pulled up here. Um, I When I ran that, the one other thing I wanted to mention uh, is bumped up that pool size to 1,500 lineups here. So we've got a pool of 1,500. Uh, a couple things that I think are just worth mentioning right off the bat here. So the first, uh, and this has changed since last year as well, but the Sabre scores have changed a bit. Um, there's more options here. Uh, it's it's there's There's more choices in general. We'll default to the correct one based on or the one that we think is correct based on the size of the slate and the contest that was selected in the build settings. Uh, these are also now not as much of black boxes as they used to be. Uh, Saber score has always been something we've put a lot of time into uh, working on, um, but was never really clear to anybody what it actually was. So what Saber score is designed to do is be an improvement upon projected score. Uh, average projected score of a lineup is a decent proxy for the strength of that lineup but it does not take into account the raw scoring upside of that lineup, especially in a sport where players are not normally distributed like baseball. It doesn't take into account correlations and it does not take into account ownership of the lineup. Uh, so Saber score is intended to really improve on all those things. So if we click into this here, uh, we'll take a look at what actually gets included in this. So the Saber score for a large slate, large field contest for baseball here. Uh, is partially the projection of a lineup. It's still important to have a a baseline, uh, strong projected lineup. The 99th percentile of the lineup, which is what does this lineup score when it's reaching its top 1% outcome? Uh, This is weighted higher than the projection of a lineup here in this case. And this is also going to capture things like correlation. When a lineup is achieving that top 1% outcome, it is often because an entire team was projected for four and a half runs and they scored 12. 
Uh, so you capture some of that natural correlation there. Uh, and ownership through adjusted ownership. And I want to talk about this here in just a second. But obviously, we care about the relative value of fantasy points here. Uh, if a guy scores his 99th percentile and, and is in 90% of the lineups, uh, clearly not as good as a guy that is in 1% of lineups here. So leveraging those three tools, uh, those three calculations here to quantify the strength of a lineup here with those new saver scores. And this was all recently back tested as well for the start of the baseball season. Awesome. Uh, real, real quick um, before you get into the meets a little more is something you had told me about like six months ago. I, I didn't even realize this was the case. And I've been kind of using this as kind of a way to, uh, mediate or whatever or 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 uh normalize uh the, the variance of some of the lineups mm -hmm. is when you you when you first run this you get like your top 150 out of 15 of a pool of 1500 yeah was originally sorted by a default saber score right which is which is whatever that is yep and and if you now if i'm not mistaken if you now switch that to projected score it's still taking from that pool of saber score built lineups, right? It doesn't like then replace all 1500 with a new 1500 kind of optimal projected score, right? Yes, you're correct. Yeah. So the lineups are already built and the lineups themselves were built with simulations and with correlation in mind. Uh, the This is purely the sorting method of right. those builds. Uh, so when you switch for baseball, when you switch from Sabre score to projected score, you can see your stacks do not disappear completely. We're still getting five right. stacks, five threes, four fours. Uh, what I think is most likely to happen if you were to do that is you probably get a little bit smaller stacks or maybe stacks that are, you know, more one-offs. And you'll probably mostly for baseball increase the ownership of your lineup by quite a bit. Uh, just like the Blue Jays are projected for almost six runs tonight. I think the highest projected team on the slate, the chalkiest stack, it looks like early today here, uh, obviously popping an average projection. So we get a lot more Blue Jay stacks, uh, a lot more exposure to the highest owned plays. Um, but the lineups in the pool are constant at this point. We're just sorting, changing the sorting method here. Do, well, do, the, lineups, do the lineups as built take in, not take into account. Talk, talk to me about leverage a little bit. Um, so it seemed as though that maybe it was last season that when there was say a high owned pitcher or whatever it is that either Sabre or Sam, I don't want to say didn't like, but, 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 but if they wanted to build lineups, um, there'd be a lot of, lot of lineups that would just, that would stack against that, that, that pitcher. Um, my, 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 my question is, is does the lineup build, you know, look for that, uh, look for leverage in, in that type of way? Yeah, so it, it can. I think it's a good opportunity to talk about this adjusted ownership column because this is new. This is new for the season. I think it's pretty cool. So uh, what adjusted ownership is doing is it's taking the player's ownership projection here and then adjusting it based on the variance of that player in the simulations. And the idea there is that uh, chalk is not necessarily good or bad. It, it's it's different depending on the, the dynamics of the slate and the individual player in question here. Uh, if there is a player that is going to be extremely chalky, but is very low variance and projected very well and achieves those outcomes often, we're generally okay eating a little bit of that chalk and playing some of that player. On the flip side, if there is a very chalky player who is very high variance, who rarely uh, achieves the, or has a high distribution of outcomes here and doesn't get to those ceiling outcomes as often, that ownership is almost worse in that case. Players are, the field is assuming that player is more reliable than they are. Uh, so the adjusted ownership is basically intended to get at that. So we are adjusting players up or down based on that individual variance there. So a really good example of this is if we look at the chalkiest hitters on the slate, their adjusted ownership is all going to be higher than their original starting ownership here because they are hitters in a high variance sport like baseball, right? Brandon Lau here projected for 20% ownership as the chalkiest player on the slate so far. We're saying that ownership almost counts as if he was actually going to be 26% owned because his most common outcome is zero and 50% of the time he barely does anything. The field is assuming he is more reliable than he is. Mm -hmm. For pitchers, it's a little flatter. Most of the time we end up having an adjusted ownership very close, maybe slightly higher, maybe slightly lower than the actual ownership. But that's because these pitchers are a little bit more, obviously not as reliable as something like NBA, but a little bit more reliable than they, the hitters are. So Sheets, to your question, I think in the past, 
we had a tendency to be aggressive with fading very chalky pitchers because our approach to ownership was very aggressive and the pitcher player pool is smaller than the hitter player pool. So the absolute ownership numbers on these guys was just higher than, than they were for the hitters. So a lot of times Saberson saw like the easiest mathematical way to solve that ownership problem was to just fade the chalk pitchers. Uh, that can still happen a little bit. You see on a slate like tonight, uh, mm-hmm. we are a little low on Valdez and Castillo here, uh, but it'll be a little less extreme than it used to be in the past. And I think in general, the new adjusted ownership prefers to fade the chalky stacks as opposed to fading the chalky pitchers, but all other things being equal. Just to follow up once more, just to follow up on that, but, but more, but more um, in depth there, not, not only, uh, did the uh, lineup builders uh, either, you know, fade the pitcher, but, but they would, they would play the opposing hitting stack to it it, uh, against him, you know, to get kind of double leverage against, against that. So I guess, you know, I guess more of like a saber sort score type question. I mean, does, does, does ranking lineups and building lineups with that in mind, does it look for that type of, 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 of situation where, you know, we, we don't, we don't like Valdez, like for example, Mm -hmm. and we talk about this a lot, Bobby and I, like, if you think that Valdez is, is kind of weaker than his ownership or is even adjusted ownership would indicate there are several ways to handle that. Number one is like the most aggressive way to to deal with it is just play the, play the opposing hitters because, because if people are going to play that pitcher and you get good, you know, hits Mm -hmm. off them, you get like double, double leverage. But, or if you just didn't, you know, want to get that aggressive, the other ways to get leverage is to just, you know, play different pitchers, yeah. you know, or, or something like that. So that I guess that was more of the, the point was like the, yeah. the, the stacking of the hitters take into account like the ownership of the pitchers against them. We, we do the this all the time, but like my guess is like if it was a, a five game slate, like then you would see a bunch of Detroit stacks pop up with Valdez's ownership like this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But because we have so many other options for them to be optimal for a guy who only gave up more than three runs twice in his last 40 starts, doesn't seem like it makes much logical sense. Whereas on a th- on a four or five game slate, getting that extreme leverage might make more sense than it would on this giant slate. That's just sort of a general thing, I think. Anyway, and and just to add on that, uh, last year, you know, Jordan, if you want to pull up the sliders, uh, we did have three sliders previously. There was a third ownership fade slider, which we have yeah. removed, and basically the reasoning behind that is that we were up, we were adjusting projections with an ownership multiplier. Uh, when we were creating the lineups and then we were also grading lineups with ownership in mind. So we've taken away some of that double counting. And and that's also why the correlation slider is higher this year Uh, in the formula that Jordan pulled up. There is not a correlation grading aspect of the lineups. We're trying to just account for the correlation as a slider and then let the upside uh, be part of the grading here. And then we're only trying to grade for ownership and not adjust projections uh, during the lineup building process. So I think that's why you could have seen some of those really aggressive uh, ultra leverage lineups last season. If, if, I, if I'm getting too in depth and it should be saved for like office hours or more or whatever, just let me know. But I just did have one other thing I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Um, especially when you have correlation just jammed all the way to the right, which is kind of what I like to do anyway. What I found is specifically in FanDuel, but but also sometimes in, in, in DraftKings and sometimes it comes up in hockey too, is that when you, you search for correlation, like, and you really search for correlation, what you end up getting is a lot of lineups with a lot of money left on the table. Um, and and I, I found more of this in FanDuel than anything else. And sometimes it was really extreme. So you'd have, you'd have like a situation where you had like a four or three and you had a choice of either having one other player to make it a, a, a pretty four, four or even, and, or play like Mike Trout for like mm-hmm. 1500 more. And it would never play Mike Trout for 1500 more. You know, it always like leave 1500 on the table, you know, just so that they can get the pretty, Four four correlation and on FanDuel, I found I found it a little I don't want to say troubling, but I found it kind of listen. I I I, I trust the process, so I I'll leave all the money on the table. I I'll do it, but it it just seemed as though that when you when you were really like demanding correlation right out of out of your lineups, you ended up making these kind of like weird choices. Like uh, I can either play the fifth guy on the Marlins at two K flat to get a better correlation, or I can play Aaron Judge. Well, you know, I'd rather leave forty two hundred on the table, not play Aaron Judge, just so that I can get my two K fifth 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 guy in there. I don't see the same issues this year so far, 
Um, especially not on draft because I don't really play FanDuel that much, but mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that was even noticed, if, if not dealt with. No, it definitely was. Uh, it was definitely noticed. I think another thing I, I found last year is there was a tendency to often overuse eight and nine hole hitters because of the wraparound of the lineup. A lot of times you're stacking that one, two, three, four, or whatever. Uh, that ninth batter is, is often very nicely correlated, but very low projection projected to that stack. You'll still yeah. get those guys from time to time. I mean, we see a couple of them here at the, the first uh, lineups here in the pool, but the upside correlation and the change to sim diversity here, I think have probably helped a fair bit with that in terms of actually building better lineups. Mm -hmm. I also, I, at, at times I'm a bit of a, min salary at zero truther with saber sim uh to really just let the sims take over in baseball because we're talking about you know there are probably trillions of possible lineups on an 11 game slate here tonight uh i actually do kind of like leaving this at its default value which will just it'll just protect against that a little bit right it, with how, with how many lineups there are and how small 1500 really is uh compared to all the possible lineups that can be built i think this is a nice backstop that you could even Maybe argue makes sense just a tad higher on an 11 game slate just to protect against some of that kind of stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. And it's just, just for other people out there who maybe just in general are going to ask us questions about and it always comes up like, how much should I leave on the table? What's the right thing? Obviously, there's some slate dependency, what, you know, depending on the sport, but like an NBA, I'm, I'm almost I'm very rarely leaving more than 400 on the table, except for the end of the year where you get all the crazy players and everything. But I'm very rarely leaving more than 400 in my biggest buy in. Occasionally, I'll leave up to a thousand, but it's it's pretty unusual. And in baseball, I actually think that you I mean you're you're going to have a chance sometimes with leaving like nine, ten thousand on the table. You could there is you don't need to spend every bit of salary to just improve your your better players. And in general, correlation is what matters. So I. I just want to sort of remind everybody that in baseball, I'm never going to say like an amount on a giant slate like this. Yes. You don't necessarily want to leave 10,000 on the table, but if you wanted to leave two or 3000 on the table. Cause you like your build. Hey, I have no problem with that in general. And just, if, if you guys mind, I know it's sort of a general thing. It's not necessarily saber sim related, but anybody else have any thoughts on that one? Just cause I, I, I do think it's really, really okay in baseball to leave plenty of money on the table. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll again, I'll, I've been, I say this a lot. I, I don't, I don't have minimums or maximums. I mean, I, I'm I'm more of a of a of an algorithm than saber some truth or in that respect. Like if I just presume that if that if I'm putting my projections in and they're building lineups and I'm getting the top 150 lineups based on 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 whatever that I shouldn't I should not even look for one second at the salary. In, in, in a in a similar way, like what people are going to ask next is is and they ask this in my Discord all the time. They say, "Do you have a maximum amount you'll play of a player?" you know, or, or something like that. And the answer is always no for me, because I mean, I, that that's all gets, gets factored into all your other inputs. And if you're going to, if you're going to use this stuff, um, you know, you should start by, by accepting that these are going to be the best lineups. And so I don't have any, I don't have any minimum salaries. I don't have any max salaries. I don't have any, you know, anything like that. Um, and that's why it gets a little, yeah, listen, I, I don't mind. So sometimes, like, oh, you're leaving 1500 on the table. The last thing I want is to say, well, you know what? This is this is the time I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take the fifteen hundred and just upgrade or whatever, even though this is a real high correlation and 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 things like that. So I'll, I'm just a little different. I mean, I, I it doesn't matter what the slate is. I'm never gonna have a ma maximum amount of a player, and I'm never gonna have a minimum salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can jump in here too. I I agree in baseball in particular. I think it's uh, much more reasonable to be leaving salary on the table. Uh, because so often in baseball, you don't need to really optimize. Um, yeah, it, pricing, I guess a better way to say it, pricing is, is much looser in baseball because the player pool is so much larger than it is uh, in some of the other sports. Even though in hockey, you, you know, you get 500 guys on a team or whatever. Um, typically, the range of outcomes for hockey players is is still uh, far more narrow than it is for baseball. Mm -hmm. um, and same goes with the other sports, certainly like running backs, quarterbacks, far more projectable and, and definitely for a point guard or something like that, far more projectable than any single hitter um, yeah. on a full baseball slate. So I think it's it's much easier, much more reasonable to be leaving salary on the table. And when you get into some of the other sports, um, you know, I will tighten that down personally. But I do loosen my personal restrictions for baseball in particular because of the correlation and how heavily it is weighted into the DFS scoring. I'm putting my I'm putting myself on mute. I'm going to train wreck this for three hours. 
<laughs> All right, Jordan. Sorry, we can pick back up if you want to. Uh, and actually, I guess but to start to start to jump in here, just to kind of dovetail and get us back on track with the adjusted ownership. Um, now, when we're building, say, instead of for very large field tournaments, uh, and you're and you focus more on say like a twenty max or or single entry and three max, uh, what kind of adjustments do uh, do the, the sims really take into account as far as adjusted ownership goes there uh wondering if either of you guys could really touch on that yeah absolutely so uh the adjusted ownership is a constant uh it is on a per sure. player basis but the weighting of how it's valued into the sorting method uh changes based on the contest size so if we're looking here so let's say for the largest size contest we could get here uh, and all of these change really so in this case projection point two percentile 0.8 and then minus one uh and these are these are kind of just arbitrary weightings for for how how much these are taken into account but uh, adjusted ownership is is a, a very large negative factor here uh if we look at like a smaller field contest maybe like a high stakes single entry contest uh projection gets a boost here overall scoring upside drops down a bit uh and adjusted ownership drops down a bit as well so basically what that is to say is in a smaller field contest uh, the average projection matters a little more. Uh, that top 1% outcome is a little less necessary to win a 300-person single entry contest. Uh, and ownership is a little less important. There's just fewer raw lineups that you're competing with against uh, each percentage point of shared ownership you have with certain players just is represented by fewer lineups overall. So those weighting factors change primarily um, as your, your contest size changes. Perfect. And uh, just to add on this, because I know this is a question that that Eric had asked, um, adjusted ownership does change if you apply different projections, custom projections, whatever it may be. So it is a uh, calculation. And if you were to, uh, you know, you don't have to do starting, but if you were to go to the home screen and uh, change between different ownership uh, sources, you could see those uh see that adjusted ownership column update accordingly. Excellent. So I know a lot of guys will be, you know, toggling between the various projection sets that we've got available. We've now we've got a full three here um, for true DFS subs. So uh, I, I know that I personally will like to kind of dig into that and see how that um, really affects builds and, and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's talk about a couple things, uh, a couple places that I like to look to when, when we pull up a build here and, and where I like to start. So uh, what I, I like to do is do a little bit of just quality control with the build here and just make sure that I'm, I'm happy with what I'm getting out. This is by far for somebody that does want to leave an impact on the build, whether there are stands you want to take or research you've done or whatever it is, uh, this is by far the best place to do it because we're working with this pool of 1500 lineups that were built based on the model, based on the Sims. Uh, and all of which are are pretty viable uh, because they are individual outcomes for, for how the Sims could play out here. So uh, when we start adjusting exposure, min or max exposure to players or stacks or stack types or things like that, we're just sorting through and finding the best 150 that matches those things. So the way I typically recommend people do this is go right to left with these subheaders here. Basically, the, taking the widest angle of looking at what is the stack type of that lineup. Uh, then looking at game stacks don't really matter as much for baseball. Uh, there's not a lot of opposing team correlation. So then looking at your stack, your team stacks, uh, and then finally individual players here to, to dial things in. So um, just a really good case for the correlation slider and the Sims in general. Uh, we set no stack rules whatsoever before this build. Uh, and right off the bat, five twos, five threes, a uh, handful of five one one ones, four threes, four fours. I mean, pretty much kind of exactly what you're looking at looking for most of the time with your, your uh, stacks on DraftKings. Mm -hmm. um, just, just to throw out a quick personal take. Um, yeah. I, I do think, especially early in the season when the weather is sort of all over the place uh, game stacks, I, I've always said this about baseball that uh, I think game stacks are maybe, maybe I'm biased because that's for some reason I keep, I always like most of my six figure wins seem to be from game stacks. Yeah. A lot of that is, is weather and umpire and stuff like that dependent. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's a good while, point. While I agree that in general, it's not important, but because of the weather, especially early in the year where you have 40 degree games and 85 degree games with wind blowing it in at 20 miles an hour out of 20 miles an hour you, there, that's the, that's the time when you look for a game stack. Yeah. Or two teams that later in the year that, that are, are, you know, four starters are already missing and you know it's going to be 
you know, basically a bad bullpen game between let's say Florida, let's say Miami and uh, Detroit or something like that. You know what I mean? That's the, that's the only times where those are the times where you do look for game stacks. Just wanted to add some personal stuff on top of some of the Sabres some stuff for some other people who may be watching the videos and wanted my take on it. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we are organically getting some game stacks here. Um, I, you make a, a good point there. Um, it, it's not something I've ever looked too closely into, but the tab is here. If you do want to seek out some stacks of, of, of some games, or maybe there is a weather game or something like that, that you do particularly want to make sure that you're getting to both sides of that game there. Um, so that is available here. Um, but let's let's bounce over to the the team stacks here, um, which is where we can kind of start to get a little opinionated. You know, I, one example that we we had here right off the bat is maybe we do want to take a double fade stance on um, who was it here? Who's who's playing the Angels today? The Angels, Texas. Uh, no, the Angels. Uh, Castillo. Yeah. So um, let's say we're we're already under on on Castillo here. One of our our big stands with the pitchers. Um, let's say we do want to get a little bit of additional exposure to those those Angels bats here, and, and maybe stack that team up a bit. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, let's say maybe we want just ten percent exposure or something like that. Um, we'll pop ten percent min exposure into the Angels stacks there. Uh, apply that. Uh, and they become a, a stack we're getting to a little bit here. So mm -hmm. that pool exposure column here can be really useful for just getting a sense of how flexible is this pool? How how much exposure to teams can I get here? Um, if we look at Detroit, for example, right? Another team that uh, the chalkiest pitcher on the slate is going up against, but we're not getting very much Detroit stacks in our pool. Only 16 lineups in the entire pool that have them. So we could get a little exposure there if we wanted. Uh, we could bump that up, for example, um, but fewer lineups to work with overall with the Detroit stacks than we have with the angel stacks. So, uh, right. just a good way to start applying some of that research, maybe take some of those double, double stands leverage against those, those chalky pitchers or, or various things like that. Can I ask another question just that sort of, it does a sort of, you know, apply to this just, so you get Tampa Bay in general is all, always every, I mean, every site I've worked with, worked for, worked on, um, they always are going to pop off, pop up as as being because their value is incredible. But the reality is, three of those guys are usually going to be pinch hit for in a close game. Mm -hmm. uh, they use their number four hitter basically like a platoon spot. So, I mean, although yesterday, you know, Luke Rayleigh hits two home runs and everybody feels, oh, great, I can't believe he wasn't even more on. Well, a lot of the time he's getting two at bats there. You know what I mean? And uh, that, that's just a, it's something that that I always wonder about because I've I mean, going back, I, I remember talking to and at, at length uh, with with RG about this that everybody on Tampa always popped off as these incredible plays because the value is great and people aren't playing them as much, but there's some reason some, certain people aren't playing them as much because of this incredible pinch hit risk. Do you guys account for that um, in your, in the projections? I know, you know, maybe a silly question, but. Andrew, do you know the answer to that? Is pinch hit probability something that's captured in the Sims? I'm trying to look at their um, paid plate appearances right now in the home screen. So I think that's probably one thing that if you wanted to spot check and see, like compare versus another team, it's how many plate appearances are we showing for this player on average or or this team, mm -hmm. like compared to another team? Uh, I don't know the actual answer to that question, but this is how I would go in and try to uh, source out some more information on it right off the bat. My sense is that that is probably not something we are capturing uh, because we are not projecting any other hitters for any plate appearances. Um, oh, are we? Oh, no, that's no, 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 no. yeah, no. So, I, but I have seen, I have seen times where you do. Um, last year, okay. it's a little harder earlier in the year, too, because it's it's what Tampa does every year, but it's not necessarily like it doesn't have to be in the fold for their plan. It's just that's just the way they play baseball. Um, that just seems to be the way they play baseball, but also like they're flexible on it a little bit. Um, my guess is later in the year, as, as you, as it starts happening more often, you're going to have projections for some of the guys off the bench, even if it's one or two fantasy points, whatever, just to, to, to that, that, that sort of will bake in a little bit of the, the pinch hit risks factor. Just want to throw Yeah. And, and this, I think would be a good opportunity here. Uh, I think a, a sim may have run here, uh, while I bounce back and forth from the home screen and back because our, our stacks change, but maybe this is a good opportunity here to, to make an adjustment, right? Um, especially maybe if the, they're going to be a chalky team on the slate here tonight. If the field is gravitating towards them already, we think there's a little bit of risk for pinch hitters in the, the primary spots in the order. A good opportunity then to to drop the exposure there mm -hmm. uh, and get a little bit less exposure to, to Tampa Bay here as well. So mm -hmm. cool. uh, I also think that's just a great value add um, just in general. If, if you have that knowledge, if 
if you're able to pick up on those things for various different teams, I think that is a very strong edge that a lot of people are probably not looking at regularly. The, the other thing you could do if, if you feel that way, and this is going to seem kind of counter, counterintuitive to the other things that I've said, but, but after I make my builds and I trust Sabres him to build all my lineups, I will then go in in this kind of like post build thing and make some radical freaking decisions, you mm-hmm. know, like, like I'll t- to say some intuitive stuff. Like I'll do, I'll trust Sabres him. I'll build like 150 lineups. And then my third highest owned guy, I can just say, I just hate him and I'll X him out. You know what I mean? And what's cool about it is it'll automatically just like fill in the rest of the, the lineups with whoever, whatever else you had, you had planned for me. But like, likewise, if, if you feel that way, say about Tampa, instead of, instead of limiting the amount of Tampa exposure, you can literally just go into the yep. players and just say like, Bob, you know, that the eight hitter is, is like in danger or Choi or whoever, I don't even choice still in the league, you know, but, but whoever the guys that you're worried about, you know, and you right. could just X him out, you know, and you could still get the same amount of exposure in Tampa but just don't get exposure to the guys that you think feel have pinch pin, pin head risk. Right. The only problem is when they had two home runs yesterday. Well, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And, and the weird part with Tampa is it, it usually specifically is the cleanup hitter, but anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. It's just a funny thing. Yeah. But I, I think it's a good point. And the reason why you can really comfortably do that within Sabersim is especially through this process we've outlined here is because the pool was built agnostic to that. So you're building this pool of 1500 lineups that are, Based on game simulations, you're getting a, a percentage of your lineups based on how often certain players succeed, how often certain stacks succeed. But we only need 150 in this case to take with us into the contest. So it, it's very easy for us to just say, you know what, I don't even want to deal with the risk of of Brandon Lau hitting cleanup here oh. for the Rays might get, might get scratched mm-hmm. or pinch hit for and just X them out and you'll get the next best 150 taking that into account. Well, so you know what's interesting? Here's probably a good good opportunity to talk about the the auto apply feature, okay? Yes. So, so if you were going to do that, let's say uh we'll go back to go back to even to that spot or whoever. Yeah, yeah. so I did already X him out. So let's reset oh, so that. Go to something else. So like so let's let's say that you wanted to X out uh anybody like uh Bo Bichette, or whatever. Yeah. Um, Right now, that that auto apply thing is on. Yes. So when you click on whatever you click on over there, it's automatically going to uh, make the adjustments. Now, if that were off, like sometimes it's on. I don't know. I can't even predict when when the auto apply is going to be on or off, depending on sport. It you know? should be off by default. My understanding is that default. it's off by default. Yeah. So let's say it's off. Right. You come in here and you say, "Okay, I want to I want to X out Chapman." So you'd unclick Chapman. Right on the left and the check mark. Yes. And if and and nothing's gonna happen right now. Yes, that's correct. Until you hit apply. So you could then go do a couple of other things, like for example, if you wanted to, and then hit apply. However, if instead you have uh, put them back in, if uh if you have the apply button clicked, I mean, yeah, the auto now whatever you do on the left is automatically going to, I think. Yep. Yeah. Uh yeah, automatic. Yeah. That's that's I guess. I guess you did that so that people would would have the choice of like just saying, whoa, whoa, I'm changing my mind before before clicking it. Yes. Um yeah, I think that the main thing was people going through making a bunch of adjustments. They basically know what their adjustments are. I want this, 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 and this. It the process of adjust and then let the let the page spin, adjust, let the page spin, and so on is is kind of tedious to do every single right. slate. So this now lets you do it uh in in batches for what it's worth as somebody that is not going through and making a ton of adjustments and i typically don't know what those adjustments are all at once i just always turn this on anytime i run a build almost the first thing i do is just to turn this on so it's the way that i'm used to and the way that it was for a long time uh and making adjustments as i go and seeing the impact of that one of the things i fumble with is turn turn it off again Mm mm-hmm so let's say you turn it off and let's say that you wanted to, uh, yeah, right, right there is fine. So let's say that it, uh, that Max Scherzer, you want to uh, limit exposure to say 40%, right? So you put that in and now, now, okay, so that, so that's what's going to happen. So then now when you hit apply, that will happen. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Nice. Yeah, it, it's a little confusing. And like I mentioned before we got started here, there's, there are a couple like little bugs that do come up from time to time. It's something that that needs to get cleaned up. Um, okay. But mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I, one other thing I definitely wanted to talk about here in a build, probably one of my favorite features in the app is the Min Uniques players. Um, I think the best implementation of diversification in the industry here, uh, mostly because of where it is in the process, right? Again, a, a broken record here now, but we have this pool that already exists that was built agnostic to the Min Unique players. Uh, this will now let you diversify your pool uh, by comparing each lineup in your set, your 150 that you're ultimately taking with you against each other, right? Um, so after we have, we've capped some exposure to Scherzer, we've uh, faded some Tampa Bay, we've gotten, you know, we've made some other adjustments here. I like to increase this a bit here, just to improve the overall diversity of the lineups and make them a little bit different from one another. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, this is, you can almost get this for free. You can get three, four, five, even min unique players without even being a fraction into your pool here. Um, I'm curious just what even five min unique players does on this slate. Uh, so five players different from when comparing any two lineups in our 150 from one another uh, brings us to lineup 885 here of our pool of 1500. So in this case, actually just a bit over halfway, but uh, four min unique players um, is takes us to 672 from our pool here. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, these lineups were built, they were not, we did not send this information to Saversim and say, build lineup one and then make sure lineup two is four players different than lineup one. That's not what we did. In this case, we're building the 1500 lineups based on the Sims and then identifying the best 150 where they are all four players different. So uh, again, just in a sport where variance is so high, the ranges of outcomes are so wide for players. I like to get very diversified. I use min uniques, every sport, every slate, um, uh, just a feature that I think is especially I, worth calling out there. I would just be careful, you know, to always go back and see what your stack type distribution is when you, when you're also, when you're screwing around, you know, because, mm -hmm. because sometimes oh, if, if you get all like, like, like weird, you'll end up with like, yes, you know, all kinds of stuff that you might not want. So, so you might want to um, even, you know, just make some adjustments within your game stack, uh, within your stack type. So you always have wh whatever it is that you want. And, and I bring this up because again, this is something I always feel I have to, I have to talk about is that once you start making like a multitude of changes, eventually um, you're, you're, you're uh, the way I like to put it is Saber Sim is going to yell at you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, like if you, if you start like, like, like making this, and I don't know how many changes it was, it's going to take to make it yell at you here, but eventually once you start, yeah. You, okay. Perfect. So let's say you put something in, that's going to get, that's all of a sudden it's going to go, okay. Now, even the 1500 lineups that, that we created for you, this last change, this is the last straw. You know what I mean? If you do this, we're going to have to build you more lineups. Now at this point you have two, you have, in my opinion, three choices. One is you could click keep editing two you could hit send exposures and third you could just basically rebuild okay so 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 the rebuild concept is basically saying listen if saber sim is going to build you 1500 lineups and you can't even get you know any lineups of the 1500 based on your changes your changes probably suck okay that, that that's 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 the rebuild model the other one you could do listen if you want to be really stubborn you could click on on this the send exposures and it'll do that for you but the keep editing button is kind of interesting because if you click keep editing, it will make some of the changes sort of right yeah. that you want, right? So talk about I mean, what I would say. My advice again: once you get to that that to that level of 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 hatred from from the algorithm to you, you're probably just 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 doing something wrong. Yes, and I agree. I I think at the very least that message should be a big red flag of like. You are you are essentially now disagreeing with the model or the sims. There's something fundamental to the way that you know we've simulated the slate that you disagree with. If you're getting this message here, and something needs to change, um, I think I I would at least take pause and decide. Okay, how strong are my stances? If you are deciding to just roll through that and like I've done my research, I want to to handle the slate this way. What I would actually do is yeah. I would go back to the home screen. And I would make some of those adjustments in the form of the inputs to the sim itself. So let's say what, what I actually did there in that last case to break it was yeah. force tiger stacks because we said we're fading okay. Valdez here. We want okay. tiger stacks. Perfect. Okay. Give me fuck tiger stacks. Saberson says, no, we're not doing that. Okay. So now what do we do? I would have make an adjustment to the tigers team total or oh, to the individual cool. hitters on the, the team and basically tell Saberson, no, like, I actually think that this is the game outcome that is the mean average here. 
and it will go through, it will adjust the projections based on what the Sims look like when that is the outcome. And now if we go here, we'll look at real quickly, I'll just show you here what this does. So uh, this is going to give a boost to Tigers hitters wow. here. It's going to give a, a a drop to Valdez. Now, if we go in and build, we're going to have more Tiger stacks to work with in our pool. The pool will be wow. more flexible to our angle we want to take on the slate because we've changed the inputs. Now Saberson is simulating it through that lens where everything else on the slate is the exact same, but the Tigers team total is 3.4 instead of 2.9. And we could bump it up further. We could say, wait, if they score four runs, right? Um, and so on. But that is really, once you see that message that says, we can't find lineups you want, check yourself, decide, is this really the way I want to take this slate? And if it is, go back to the home screen and apply some of that as inputs to the system instead of just trying to force that in after uh, is, is my best recommendations there. And Jordan, just to piggyback on that a little bit, um, I, just to talk a little bit more about adjusting team totals and going back to what Bobby was saying about, you know, finding some game stacks early in the year where everything just kind of uh, has all the right factors. Uh, adjusting the team totals is probably the best route to go just because um, if you were to adjust individual players, it only has an effect on that one player it, it shifts that one player's distribution but if you're making adjustments to team totals we are um making adjustments to every player in the lineup and the pitchers on both sides of of the diamond and that really is what takes into account uh the correlations still so just just some notes on team total adjustments you, you want to give them give everybody again i, I don't know how uh, much how uh, much people know about Saberson. You want to give like five minutes on 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 late swap and how to do that. Yeah, the definitely entry, the entry editor or whatever. However long, I mean, I could be here for all day. So how, as, how much time as you want? I mean, like, yeah, I don't have an entries file uh, for oh, tonight right. Um, okay. right now, but that's okay. We can talk about late swap here um, and how it works. So, a couple notes. So, when you we've entered our lineups here at Lock, we're happy with where we ended up. Uh, we're getting ready for these 5:40 local time games for for me. I, actually, we probably already have the starting lineup at lock, but let's say let's say something happens, right? So we come back to to update our lineups here at, at 5:40. Uh, if you just click new build here, uh, this will once we detect that a slate is started, default to a late swap build here. Uh, it is the very similar except for this big yellow flashing late swap settings here. Uh, and what it is going to do is it's going to take every lineup that you already had. Uh, lock in the players whose games have already started and remove all the other players whose games have started that are in the pool uh, and can't be re can't be added to a lineup and then make the best possible lineups with the new updated Sims for every other lineup we have uh, and new this season as well. Very excited about this is you now have a pool of lineups to work with, with your late swap as well. So we're taking in this case, if we had a 150 set of lineups uh, and we have a pool of 1500, in late swap, each lineup is going to be swapped 10 times. There'll be 10 candidate lineups of, is the way I like to look at it here uh, for what each lineup can become based on the new Sims and rebuild that pool here. And it will look basically the exact same as any other build. You can edit exposures, you can adjust min uniques, uh, but it takes into account the, the most up-to-date information. So uh, let's say we're going through the slate and surprise scratch Valdez uh has a stomach ache and isn't pitching tonight changes the slate completely uh ownership changes the tigers projections change everything's changes uh you can update those lineups here mm. just just with that fresh build so i am lacking an entries file to actually go through and, and do this um but while, while, while you're doing that one one toggle that i saw that you may want to touch on um the the allow opposing pitcher uh opposing pitcher a uh, batter um where where is your where is your break even like at what what slate size do you do you allow that i think I mean, you make it the default i think it is just two game slates it mm -hmm. might be three it is on for two uh we, i think we had a three game slate yesterday it might just be two okay. um okay Let's check four. We had a four game slate yesterday. No, there's no way they'll allow it for four. Yeah, not on for four. There uh, is a three game slate tonight if you want to double check. Oh, is there? Yeah, the night slate, I believe. Yep. Okay. Let's see here. Well, in any case, on short slates, uh, if you do want to adjust that, um, yeah. you know, that is the default. So be aware of that if anybody's building oh, for yes. short slates like that. Yeah. Um, the one other thing to be aware of is. So it is on yeah. for three game slates as well. Okay. Um, 
batters and their opposing pitchers are so spectacularly negatively correlated to one another that even with it on, I would say it is pretty unlikely yeah. that you are going to get any lineups in your pool that feature yeah. that with any non-zero correlation. So if you are intentionally seeking out those lineup constructions, I know maybe on two game slates, if you really want to get kind of weird, uh, do something a little bit unique and play a pitcher against a couple bats on the, on the other side, you are probably going to have to turn correlation down heavily and maybe all the way to zero uh, to get that done. Just because those, those correlations are very negative. Um, I get the argument in a, maybe a large field contest for a very small slate, uh, but you're maybe not like going to get much on its large own. Large field, small slate, high stolen base rate. Yeah, like maybe a qualifier or something like that where yeah. you need to get really off the board, you know. Yeah. Three gamer, yeah. So while so while you, while he's doing the entry thing, the other thing I'll mention, which we're not going to get in, get into today, is 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 that is that Sabersim is also very unique, uh, uniquely uh, uh, effective in in showdown. Um, uh, I don't play as much baseball showdown as we have a couple of guys actually in our discord that play a lot of baseball showdown, um, or a little decent amount. And, and I always like Saberson for football showdown in general and baseball showdown as well. Like, uh, I mean, we don't, we won't have to get, go through full showdown theory, but, but within, but within, within Saberson's, uh, YouTube, uh, channel, there's at least one, maybe three, right. Uh, of videos on, on specifically, using Saber Sim for showdown. I don't think it probably hasn't updated for this year's rollout, whatever, but, but it was, it was, it was a huge like hour and a half thing. Yeah. And I have, and I'll have a new video, a shorter, a little more abridged version of that coming out this week as well through our YouTube oh, channel. Right. But um, yeah, very, very useful for baseball showdown. Um, again, a, a sport and a game type where you often need the optimal or very close to win. Uh, that is literally what Saber Sim does. It takes single game outcomes builds the optimal lineup and then builds you a 1500 lineup pool from which to choose from. Uh, but, so yes, I, but, I, but, but with say with Saber Sim and showdown, that's going to be a, a, um, a sport where your, your extra knowledge is going to be really helpful with the relievers specifically. Cause Saber Sim will sometimes yes. spit out like all these relievers that have like no hope of actually getting in because when you send the games, like sometimes they get in, you know what I mean? Um, but if you knew they pitched the day before, so, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you know about the relief pitchers, you know, whatever it is, that's something where you could add your own, you know, post build value to, or even pre-build value. So uh, I entered into a quick contest here. So let's walk through this process because this is useful as well. So I, I just entered 20 lineups here, but we've got our build. We're happy with everything. We've made our adjustments. Uh, how do we get these onto the site? Very easy. Fill entries. If we're entered already, we can just click this. It will download that file for you, drag and drop, and we've got a, a entries file here. So just make sure that we have the contest selected correctly here and fill them. And then I will download these, open DraftKings, take us back to the right page on DK to get this uploaded. Um, so very easy. I know, I think in particular with CSV files and that part of the process, uh, People get pretty attached to the way they have been doing it for a long time. Which yeah, is that's so funny. I, I never did it that way. That's I so have cool. I've never done it that way. That's, that's so brilliant. much faster. I, yeah, I'm going to go insane. back to this video. I can't wait to go back to this video and watch you do that again. Yeah, that entries is fantastic. It's it's great. And I, I just entered one contest here to have an entries file. I mean, if you've got 50 contests, it just even gets that much better. Um, so... I would highly recommend playing with it, experimenting with it, trying it once when you have plenty of time and you're not up against yeah. lock because I've just seen over and over again, it's like somebody tries it for the first time and they're like, wow, that's so much better. But it's hard to give up this part of the process for people because it's it's it feels risky, like changing the way you're handling your CSVs. But uh, it is a game changer. So I'm going to do it right now. Like This is amazing. Two <laughs> sheets. You got all the things you could put up there. You got 95 different sports going on. <laughs> my new, my new toy. It's a my new toy. Yeah. Since we're, since we're talking about these, let me, let me mention what these fill methods are real quick. Um, Cause I think they're, they're useful here. So uh, unique random is actually the one that I typically prefer to use. This is only, this only matters if you're entering multiple contests for what it's worth, but uh, unique random will put a unique lineup from your set into each entry randomly. Um, it will take your, any lineup in your set, right? The one, the 150 or the 20 in this case and fill it randomly. Uh, unique rank will put a unique lineup into each contest here, but in order they are ranked in Sabre score. 
Uh, so if you wanted to do something like sort by highest buy-in to lowest, and then put your best saver score lineup in your highest buy-in contest, unique rank would be what you were looking for. Um, and then rank, I think is kind of the one that I see people use a little bit less, but still useful sometimes. Let's say you're playing a, sing a bunch of single entries, a 20 max, a 150 max, and you're building a one, you're building 150 lineups and you want the same lineup in all of your single entries and you want the same top 20 in all of your 20 en entries uh, you would use the rank fill there. Um, so I think it defaults to unique rank or maybe unique random here. Um, but those are, those are what those, those do there. So, awesome. um, but let's, let's quickly talk about late swap here. Cause I, I do want to actually, um, go through a couple things here now that I have this. So, uh, a couple things that are cool here. So let's say hypothetical Max Scherzer gets ruled out, uh, this red flashing icon, this will fire any time that we detect that a player that is out that has been ruled out of the game is in your entries file. Um, gives you a very quick way to get that player out and avoid any zeros. So you can, it'll give you the player, Scherzer in this case, hypothetically scratched. Uh, what do you want to do with him? Replace him with the best available player or best available player from the same team. Uh, I like best available for pitchers, which happen a little less frequently. I think best available from same team is a little bit better for batters to maintain your stacks. But this is just like a two second way of, oh, crap, a player got ruled out and I don't want a zero. Um, so we'll do that. It's saying, hey, you're getting Shane Bieber in 16. You're getting Castillo in four. Uh, download again, go back to DraftKings. And now I'm not eating a Max Scherzer zero in this hypothetical. Um, so that's always the first thing I check. I check back basically every time there's a new game window starting and just double check and make sure that that's not red. If it is, first thing I do is, is do that to make sure I'm not going to get burned there. But um, now we can actually run the late swap. So again, if you click this, it will default to late swap if we know that it is mid slate. Settings are all the same. Uh, main thing that I probably want to do here is change this to 1500 and late swap these builds here, um, which in a slate would lock the players whose games have already started, rebuild the best possible lineups around them and give us another build to work with here. So it'll take a second to run. Late swap is just a tad slower than the, the actual build. Um, While we have a second here, um, I was checking with the team and we do account for pinch hit uh, probability. So we have baseline mm -hmm. pinch hit probabilities for each player in a lineup. And then if we are in a point in the sim, say uh, it's like the sixth inning and, and we have a lefty pitcher facing a, a lefty hitter, we actually boost the pinch hit probability uh, for the batter in that instance. So since we're doing the sims uh, at bat by at bat, we come to a point uh, late in the game where it's like lefty hitter, lefty pitcher, we actually boost the pinch hit probability in that instance. That's fantastic. And, That's and I could, I could tell yeah, you just from, good. from experience in late swapping and, and do it all these kinds of shenanigans late in baseball um, uh, with, with 99% certainty, nobody else is doing that. So uh, it's saber sim in, in this regard uh, makes this incredibly easy. I've used, optimizers uh pretty much everybody's uh out there on the market and um you know these new updates from from saber sim this season specifically for baseball uh, are going to make uh mass multi-entering entering um or even you know building 20 max three max teams uh, a hell of a lot easier and more convenient and more enjoyable um definitely for me so I'm, I'm really looking forward to diving into all the new uh the new features for this year Right on. Thanks for the feedback. Happy yeah. to hear it. Yeah. Really stoked about it. Really impressed. Yeah. So I'll just close the loop here. So we, we've got our late swap build up. Um, we can make any adjustments, do the things like that here uh, as we would normally. Once we're done, in this case, no fill entries, right? The entries are already filled. We know what you're playing because you're late swapping. Uh, just download this, um, which is going to download a new file. Once again, good to go. Um just that easy. So um, NBA is where it really shines for late swap in particular, but uh, definitely something that you need to pay attention to for baseball as well. So makes it, makes it pretty smooth there. Definitely. That is uh, at least kind of my uh, basics here of, of what really somebody needs to get down. Um, I think to, to start having success. Um, I know we went a little bit deeper into some of this stuff, which is great. Uh, do you guys have, 
No. Any other questions that have come up? Um, anything else that you, that you wanted to ask us here or anything else like that? No, I, I know she said to go jump and take a call, but I think that was really, really good. And I think it's really, really helpful. I appreciate the time from you guys. Um, I don't have anything else to go over. I felt like that was really, really well explained. And it kind of makes me want to start scripting lineups right now. Yeah, we got him. We got him. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, no, but I, I really appreciate the time. I think that I think that was really, really well done. And I'm sure we'll have questions from some of the users coming up, mm -hmm. um, which I'll, I'll hit you guys up with. But as of right now, I think we're I think we're good. Anything for you, Goldie? No, nothing for me. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just mention here uh, right before we get out of here, we do have the Saberson channel up in the uh, True DFS Discord. If there's ever questions, you can fire away in there. I know a lot of the, the True DFS guys find their way into our Saberson Discord as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, I'll, I'll drop a link towards the end of this here um, to that chain, to that server, so everybody can join. We'll, we can get you guys hooked up with permissions there. You can always ask our team any qu questions or anything like that. So uh, always happy to help. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your guys' time. Um, We'll, uh, we'll, we, uh, we've got this done for baseball, but we did it for, we did it for basketball a while ago. And I think we'll, you know, if we can try to once a year, maybe update for the major sports, we'll maybe do an NFL one before the NFL season. Starts. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Andy. And thanks so much, Jordan. Uh, good luck to everybody out there and let us know if you have any questions and, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys hopefully at the top of the leaderboards. Good luck, everybody.